of course, I'm not there, so I call from a girl's house, and I say, hi, Mom, I'm, I'm home. And she says, oh, okay, um, Joel, this is my stepdad at that point, Joel left some money on the desk for you. How much is there? <laughs> and I'm like, crap, $5? Okay, well, I'm going to be home any minute now, so I'll see you at home. Boom, I'm out the door, right? Like just flying down the street. I have my, a friend of mine is, uh, lives right behind, behind our house, and so I run through his backyard, hop over the fence like MacGyver, right? Whack, land, and my mom is standing right at this. And, you know, those kinds of, this, that's like my life, it feels like. It, and that, um, and that's one of my friends, uh, Tiffany Fleming, a, a, a colleague of mine, uh, used to use this term all the time, craptastic. And I like, I love that word. I don't know why I do. I have to put money in the cuss cup at home every time I use it. It's fine. Um, and this is how I would define that. The result of bad choices, my mother is always one of those that says, make good choices. You know, we say that now to our kids. Doesn't kill you. Doesn't leave any scars that are particularly hard to heal. You can laugh about it now. Right? Those kind of things. And it teaches us something about life. And so I'm writing this book now kind of as a, if any of you have ever read Tina Fey's Bossy Pants, right? Right. If you, so that is, is Dave Barry, Tina Fey. I'm trying to write something along those lines that kind of are funny, but it's going to um, hopefully teach us a little bit about stuff. So we're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about race first um, and give you a little bit about um, this background. This is my grandmother, uh, Marie Averis. Marie Averis, this is her in the Philippines. Uh, she came to the Philippines in the mid-40s. Um, uh, right after some of the GIs were being sent home from the war. My, my grandmother came from uh, island, an area called Leyte, which some of you have heard of, in a city called Tacloban, which you all have been hearing about because that's the hardest hit center of the typhoon that hit last November. And so she came from that city, grew up there, and she came home um, because she married a GI. So the GI brings her all the way back to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. They, yeah, you know exactly, huh? Those of you that know our civil rights history, right? Of all of, well, in the 40s, to, <laughs> to bring a brown woman to Little Rock, Arkansas. And then he discovered when he got there, I can't take you home to my parents. And left her. So, and this is, this is a common story um, for many, many Filipinas that, that married GIs. They brought him here, you know, and, and the, the thinking in the head is, I brought you to the United States. You should be grateful, right? And so she was in Little Rock, Arkansas when she first got the U.S. My grandma is one of those crazy ladies, right? Everybody has one in their family. You, you kind of want to be that one. Like, I'm, I'm the crazy uncle. I'm the crazy dude. It's, it's a positive. My grandma was that person. And I don't think she would have survived unless she was, right? She would, get out, she would tell us these stories later on in life. She said, oh, yeah, that time I had to get on the bus and I didn't know where to sit. And we're all like, yeah, that seems pretty serious, grandma. And she's like, no, I would get on. She'd get on the bus, and the bus driver would say, oh, 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 you're white. You sit up here. And she looked and goes, but I'm not white. And, no, no, you're white, but I'm not. No, you are. You sit up here. And she would talk about these things all the time, about how she would live in that culture and society at that point and not know where to go. And that kind of influenced my life and her life as, um, as we all grew up. So we're gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I also want to talk about church, because we're here. This is my grandfather, Esteban de los Reyes, which is the coolest name ever, right? I mean, and whenever I say his name, you kind of have to say it like that, Esteban de los Reyes. Um, but, you know, when he comes to the United States, they change it to Steve Reyes, because that's all the border person could pronounce, I guess. Uh, this is uh, sitting at one of the early meetings in Stockton, California. My grandfather um, was uh, part of this uh, founding church in Stockton called Trinity Presbyterian Church. Stockton, California is where, if any of you saw this, the Cesar Chavez movie, can any of you see that? So right in the Central Valley is where, um, that's a, it's a very good movie, this little sidebar. You'll notice I'm going to do this throughout our evening. I'm going like, to take these little side trips. Cesar Chavez is a great movie, but if you read anything about it, they left out the Filipinos. And there's been this very tender tension between the Latino and Filipino community about how much the united farm workers... The United was the Filipinos and the Latinos, right? You don't really hear that story. Anyway, sidebar. So they're in, on strike, right? And so I know somewhere in Stockton, the denominations got together in some room and said, you get the Filipinos, 
you get the Latinos, you get, because what happened in Stockton is the Methodists got the Latino community, the Presbyterians got the Filipinos. It was very interesting to see how they are very distinct groups in, in, San, in Stockton. So this is um, my grandfather who was a founding elder uh, in the Presbyterian Church there in Stockton, which for those of you that know Filipinos, to not be Catholic is a huge issue, right? And especially then, to come out of the United, what is now known as the United Church of Christ in the Philippines, you were basically saying you were communist. I mean, that was really what that was about. If you weren't Catholic, you then must have been a communist. And so for this community to do that, it was very important for them. They also didn't name it, a, they didn't name it Trinity Filipino Church. They knew that that area was going to be continually in transition and that it would be the first place that people would come to in Stockton. And that has played, played out where it's a poor part of the city. And that's, that church has always been incredibly progressive um, around sexuality and around uh, economics and all kinds of things that I've, I didn't really capture until I left there. So this is kind of my form. But I'll talk about church a little bit. Of course, we're going to talk about technology. How many of you know what that symbol is? Okay, how many of you don't know what it is? Okay, so I want, I, um, I, don't say anything if you know what it is. So I come out of my room one time and my daughter tweets out this. Because, right, it's three prongs, like it's probably some church thing you got at a conference, right, or whatever. And so um, now, well, so what I did is I put it on Facebook and I say, don't tell me if you know, don't say what it is, but if you know what it is, put yes or no, and then how old are you? And so at that point, this is three or four years ago, it was about early 30s was the break, because this is a technology that disappeared, right? This was, if you had, she's showing, are you showing a picture of what it is? <laughs> Everybody's like, well, now it's going to feel like a big, huge thing. You know, it's like, no, it's actually not that big of a deal. So if some of you remember records, actual records, right? You see them now mostly as artwork, right? So they're the, the little spiders that go inside the 45s. They're obviously not that big in real life, but that's what it is. So I'm going to talk about technology a little bit too. And then parenting. This is for you. Yeah. So these are, and these are tickets to the playoffs because the A's went to the playoffs last year. Did the Giants go to, oh, they didn't. Right. Well, but the Giants' response is, but we've won two World Series in the last four years, so, you know, that's all right. We're playing the Yankees today, though. Can't we have mutual hatred for the Yankees? <laughs> I'll get to the whole hate online thing in a minute. Okay, uh, but um, here's my, my philosophy on parenting. Right? I mean, that's really kind of what I think it is. And, you know, people are, you're brainwashing your kids. I'm like, well, yeah. Right? Isn't that what we do? And then we give them the tools to begin to think on their own and all that. But essentially, we're giving them these grounding blocks. So I'll talk about it a little bit later. So I'm going to show you this video, though. Everything I do in my life and in ministry is really about who is coming next. It's both about who's coming next and who's, been, who's come before me to help me be in the place that I am. This is a video that a friend of mine um, just did, um, uh, and it, it uses, it's very sweet to me because all of the women in this, uh, in this video I knew since they were in kindergarten. And uh, this was a video done for an environmental conference that was held um, last year. And so let's take a watch of this one real quick. I've been thinking about things, things that you tell me and I pretend not to hear. I do listen to you. Deep down, I do. But what I really do is watch. Truthfully, a lot of what you want from me and my generation, I don't see happening. I am one small being. One voice, one vote. How can we make a difference in the world where things look pretty good from the outside, but are broken on the inside? Inequality is still the norm. Extreme poverty is ignored. Women are still oppressed. While our politicians are paralyzed, rich guys on Wall Street mostly guys, white guys, are still making billions of dollars. And huge global corporations are buying up land and water rights for tax breaks and profits at the expense of local communities, mostly poor and of color. Our planet is overheating. Extreme weather is happening more and more often. 
Oil companies continue to drill offshore and in our backyards. Healthcare and medicines are out of reach by those who need it most. And war is waged daily in the name of peace. Will it take changing things little by little? Or do we need to do it all at once? Politically, economically, socially. Do we need to work with what we have? Or do we need to start over? You always tell us to make smart choices, be inclusive, be just, care for others who can't take care of themselves, that if we use our imaginations, we can do anything we put our minds to. We can solve this. We expect you to, just like you expected of us. Mm. Right? That's Anissa at the end there. And that little look she gives is like, oh, okay. Right? I mean... It's this generation of folks kind of saying, don't fetishize us in many ways. Like, do what you're saying we should be doing. And so part of everything that I think we do um, has to be not just about hoping for the next generation to take care of it, but we're, we're actually called to do some stuff. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about um, how we might be able to do that. But let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm, um, Robin and I have been married for, um, it'll be 24 years in December, which... Um, I used to joke with her when we were like married five or ten years. I'm like, it's been the best 25 years of my life. And uh, now I'm like, yeah, it's been the best 35 years of my life. It doesn't have the same ring. But um, it's an interesting thing to be married 24 years um, in today's culture because most of our friends, first, they didn't get married as young as we are. And we have many friends that have been through uh, divorces and all that. And um, so we really, I mean, it, it's been a, a very interesting thing. We value that greatly. But it didn't, always, it didn't start that way. Um, my, I was 19 when I got engaged, and uh, I had never dated anybody longer than about six months. And so I meet Robin at a Presbyterian conference in Louisville, Kentucky, because that's where all Presbyterians meet. It's our national office area. Um, and uh, it was a college event. We met. Um, she would often joke that she thought I was uh, much more religious than I really am, because uh, I would, <laughs> oh my gosh, I would go to these conferences wearing these big old wooden crosses and stuff. Because I figured it helped me pick up girls. So, uh, like, I'm going to a church conference. Oh, my goodness. My, but apparently she did work. Okay? So, um, so, this, so my, we come home one day to Stockton, and um, Robin's freaking out a little bit. Because at some point I told her when we were kind of dating that I would never take anybody home to church. Right? I, I was of the philosophy that you either took a different person to home to church every Sunday or you took the one you were going to marry. Like, you didn't, because, well, you know, churches, right, they're just like, ooh, Bruce has a girlfriend here. When's the date? You know, and I'm like, oh, no, there's going to be a new one next week. Don't worry about it, right? You either go that right. Well, I asked Robin to go to church with me one Sunday, and I had totally forgotten that I told her this. And so she's like, oh, my gosh. Um, and so we go to church, and it's all fine. Dun, 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 dun. So she starts coming to church a little more regularly when we can come into town. And then about, um, I don't know, three or four months later, we get engaged. It was very romantic. Um, you know how people have these great romantic engagement stories? Um, hanging rings off of moon streams and I don't know what people do. I'd roll over one day on the road. we laying on the couch and I'm like, did you ever think about getting married? She's like, no. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, OK. Kid you not. That's exactly how our proposal went. If you start low expectations and low thing, then they just go on longer. It's great. See, I think if you build, if you do that whole, and, and Robin is the one that whenever somebody, I hope none of you did this. I'm sorry if I, like you do the big public in the stadium. Robin's like, if you ever do anything like that, I will say no just to spite you. Like whatever it is. Anyway, so my, I, we come home and we tell, we walk in and my mother is folding clothes. And I say to mom, I said, hey, mom, and then and I kiss hello. So Robin and I are getting married. Tears immediately drops the laundry, hands on her face, sobbing like somebody just died. And Robin's like, uh, my stepdad is upstairs. He comes down and says, who died? Because there was, a, there was an older woman named Mary Inasanto who was part of our church, and he just heard Mary and then weeping. And so she thought, Mary died. Oh, no. 
And so, you know, these two, and both of ours, it's funny, my mom and my, our, our spouses are white. They're like, is this a Filipino thing? What's going on? What do we do? I guess we hug now, right? So my mom is just bawling and bawling and bawling. And in good tradition, right, she's not going to, I mean, I could tell she wasn't happy, but she wasn't going to actually come out and tell me I'm unhappy with this. She needs to lean on the family members to tell me that she's unhappy. So first thing, we go to church right after that. Joys and concerns. My mom's the first one up. I have a joy. <laughs> like, <sighs> Bruce is getting married. You know, and half the people that really don't get why this would not be a good idea for some people are like, Woo, I'm so excited. And then all my aunties and uncles are like, what? <laughs> so then... After church, we do our little coffee hour thing, and Rob and I are like, we got to go out to lunch. Let's get away. We come home, and there are 30 people in my mother's house. Because she said, if you want to get married, we're throwing you a party. And so all the aunts and uncles were there. Everybody was there. And my aunts were sat me around a table. And, and they're like, so you're going to get married, huh? And then they just start grilling me. Why do you, why do you, why do you, why do you want it? Why do you, why do you, why do you, why do you? It is the only time that I have ever stood up against my mother. The only time ever was marrying Robin. And it took a long time, even at, my, at our wedding, um, whenever I want my mom to do something, I say, let's watch the wedding video. Because <laughs> my mom, if you, I don't know if any of you know my mom, Catherine knows my mom, but I don't, so my mom, when, when you know that she doesn't like someone, you won't know that, but those of us that know her, it's so painfully obvious. Like, it's the fakest smile. It's the, oh, it's horrible to watch happen, and it's worse when it's directed at you, right? I mean, so we're at our wedding, and she has my uncle, who's really excited. Sarah, are you happy about the wedding? And she says, uh-huh. Look at that. And he just pans on her. So it's this really awkward minute of my mother going, uh-huh. It's the best video ever. <laughs> ever. So that's my mom. My mom is wonderful, and she um, and so Rob and I got married. Um, we've had a few uh, bumps along the way. Um, when I so when I figure I was married, ended up getting married at 21, and uh, um, I was in Montreat, North Carolina, for a youth conference with a buddy of mine, uh, the Reverend Chuck Goodman, and I had always wanted a tattoo. Like I have always wanted a tattoo, and I knew that Robin wasn't real thrilled with him. She didn't really like him all that much. But she never kind of said, you can never get a tattoo. So uh, Chuck and I, we were um, prepping for the next year's conference. We had very little to do. And so we're sitting in the lobby in, in Montreal at this conference center. And I'm like, dude, let's go get tattoos. He's like, OK. So as good Presbyterians, good church people, we're like, well, what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get crosses, of course. <laughs> hmm, what cross do you want? I don't know. Grab a. Grab a Coke Spray catalog. <laughs> so <laughs> we go, I kid, we go to this, you know, I think about the stuff that I, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not sharing any like drug, I don't have any of those kind of stories. I have these ones that I'm like, what the hell are you thinking? So we go to this, if you've ever, you've ever been to Black Mountain, North Carolina, right, there's, there's part of it's kind of a wealthy-ish part, but then there's part that's not, right? I mean, it's just a different vibe. And we go to this, I don't know what, tattoo slash convenience store. <laughs> and we, we walk in, and like, I, I would, it's like a movie cast. You walk in, and he's, we, we talk to him, and, you know, there's all the stuff on the walls of snakes and dragons and naked women and, like, I don't think I want any of those. And he said, well, what do you want to get? And so we tore out the page. And the girl said, we, said, we want to get this. So he says, OK, that's fine. He actually didn't blink. It was actually, I was pretty impressed. He said, well, let me tell you how this works. And he pulls out like a model airplane engine duct tape around a pen that has a needle on the end. And he says, well, this is what I use. I've developed this. This is my own tool. And I'm like, where did you develop that? I've watched lots of movies. I mean, I, I, I'm anyway. So he says, "No, but I changed the I changed the needle." So it's I'm like it's still a big pen duct tape to a motor, but okay, whatever. So we make our appointments. He actually made us make an appointment because I think he was probably like, "These guys are idiots. They need to think about this before I put this on their ankle." And so we go back, and I said, "You know, I probably should call Robin." 
So I call Robin up, and I'm like, hey, honey, you know, I've always wanted to get a tattoo. Silence. So I think I'm going to get it, okay? I'd prefer that you didn't. 23. That's not no. <laughs> right? That is not no. No is no. I prefer that you didn't is if you want. Sure, go ahead. In fact, I support you. That's what I heard. So the closest that we ever got to actually, I mean, we had, there were obviously other things. You know, we were young when we got married. And we, you know, in many ways, um, I, I credit my mother and other people around us who really nurtured us through our difficult times. But that was the closest that we ever said. And well, it was her kind of saying to me, do you really want to do this marriage thing? I mean, it was one of those that kind of really pushed the edge. But, and to this day, whenever she looks at my tattoo, she shakes her head. And my children know that if they ever want to destroy the relationship with their mother, they'll get a tattoo. And so Robin and I, it's not a fun game for her, it's for me. She, we always say, I'm like, which one's going to do it, honey? Which one do you think's going to do it? And I'm, like, I'm not playing this game with you. Like, it's going to be Abby, huh? It's going to be Abby. I'm not playing this game with you. One of your daughters is going to get a tattoo. No, they're not. I'm like, okay. Hopefully they'll go out of style by then. Who knows? But... Um, Anyway, that's the tattoo story. All right, but we do have three daughters, um, and I will tell you that um, my children, unlike a lot of pastors' kids, they fight over how many stories I tell about them when I travel. It's really weird. My middle child, Abigail, there, she's wearing the, uh-oh, what day, guess what day it is? Give you what's in that commercial, it's hump day. Hump day. Um, and then Abigail, or Abigail, uh, Evelyn is in the middle, and she has the bacon periodic shirt there. Uh, and then Annie is the keep calm and geocache. She's a big, uh, big into geocaching. So those are my three girls. Evelyn is now 17. Abby on the left there is 13. And Annie is uh, 11, uh, almost 11. So these are my girls. And um, uh, they've obviously taught me a lot. You know, being a father, a parent of three girls um, is really interesting. A um, couple things. Uh, when Robin and I got married, so Robin's last name is Pew, P-U-G-H. And um, she did not... Um, it was never kind of a question she was going to take my name. One, because Reyes Chow Pew would have just been weird with two hyphens. That just seems strange. I'm like, that'd be cool. She's like, no, it wouldn't be cool. Um, and her thing was, I fought so long in my life having the name Pew that I am not giving it up. Like, that was, and the deal was, well, what are you going to do with the kids, right? Everybody's like, what are you going to do with the kids? Well, um, if we have girls, they'll have Robin's name. And if they have boys, they'll have my name. So the Reyes Chow line dies with me. That's basically um, what happens. Um, so those are our girls. So Abby and um, uh, you can just take a minute about that. So uh, my kids know the Enneagram really well. It's really scary. Uh, you know, you know, those of you who do Enneagram work, they don't fully develop until you turn 18 to 21. But my kids, like Evelyn, my oldest, um, is a one, the perfectionist. If any of you have, uh, Evelyn doesn't like to cross the street. It doesn't like to jaywalk because that's against the rules. It stresses her out to not walk in the crosswalk. And so we've, it's fun to tease her a little bit, but there are times where I know like, it actually stresses her out to do it. Oh, so much to the point where I think she's going to stop in the middle of the street, like a deer. Like, oh, I can't move anymore. Uh, but Evelyn, uh, that's, so they, they often talk about the Enneagram, and it actually has helped my oldest and youngest. Um, Annalise on there, she is a t trending like a four, a very deep thinker, very kind of just, oh, Love that kid. But when a one and a four get together, they do not get along, right? If rules, 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 why do you need to... Da, da. Anyway, those are my babies. Um, and um, they have taught me quite a bit. Um, so, I just like showing this picture because this is one of the funniest things that have ever happened to us in our, our, our family. We, you know, we're, um, Robin and I are pretty... Um, we think we're good parents. We, we try. We understand that... Parenting is not about, uh, um, it's, you know, what you do doesn't actually mean that something's going to happen. But we try to give some good boundaries and values and all those kind of things. Um, but, you know, the sex talks come up. The first one that happened was with Evelyn. And um, Evelyn um, was about three years old. No, well, maybe four. Um, no, she wouldn't have spent five. She was in kindergarten. And she was in the back seat of the car. Um, and uh, we had just had Annie. And so uh, we had three kids, and she's in the back seat of the car, and she is uh, talking with Robin. Robin's driving, 
And Evelyn says, Mom, what's sex? Right? And those of you that have had kids, work with kids, you have to make a decision at that very moment. Am I going scientific? Or am I going metaphorical? Right? Where am I going with this? And so Robin says, I'm going science. And explains exactly about sex. What happens and everything. And there's this moment of pause. And Evelyn says, Ew! You did that three times? And Robin, without missing a beat, says, yes. <laughs> and, right? and it just waits. Please don't ask any more questions, right? I was waiting for her to go and see what I do for you, the sacrifices I make. for Yeah, I was just waiting for Robin to keep loading on, but she's like, yes, please don't ask any more questions. So we come home. So, you know, we, we're, we're ready for these conversations. Like, we're, we, our, uh, my parents are pretty open, and, like, we are, I think, too open, actually. But, you know... My, her parents, not so much. She wanted to make sure she didn't make the same mistake with her kids. So we come home one day, and we see this piece of paper. Right? It's on the uh, table. And we're like, oh. There's like dolls laying around. And Robin. So now Robin and I are not freaked out at all. We're like, all right. We get to have the talk, right? This is now uh, Abby and Annie are probably five and seven or something. So they're older now. We're like, okay, like we're Wonder Twins. Wonder Twins activate. Let's, let's go have the talk. So we're like strategizing, well, how are you going to do this? What are we going to say? You know, what if they ask this? Da, da, da. So we're ready. So um, we call the girls out and we're like, hey, Abby and Annie, why don't you come out here? And we said, so we, we, we saw this. Um, so what were you guys doing? And Abby says, oh, we were playing bank. That was our label for pennies. <laughs> we were so disappointed. <laughs> we laughed so, like, like 45 minutes, Robin and I were still, like, on the floor laughing. So, our, And, of course, the girl's like, what? I don't, what's the matter? <laughs> you know, and so, like, we still, we always, so the, now the whole family laughs at us. So whenever we get change anywhere, like, it's just, and people just think we're weird, because we're like, can we have change for a dollar and please no pennies? <laughs> like, it's just part of our lore now as a family. Um, so this is Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn um, teaches me a lot about God. You know, your kids do that. That's, um, it's a lovely stage. I show this picture because she looks sweet in this picture. Um, and I always tell her, you used to be really cute. Um, so this is her at about two or three or something. But Evelyn, um, she's a great kid, good student, all those kinds of things. Um, she's 17, so we're kind of going through that college process. And, you know, it, you know, I get weepy whenever I see, like, college referenced any child leaving thing. Like, if any of you watch Modern Family, every time she goes to college or goes away, I'm like a, I'm like a mess. Um, but so Evelyn's kind of on that stage now. It's very exciting for her and all that. But she has one blemish on her record. She was kicked out of preschool. So Evelyn, um, what, I get a call from Miss Candace one day, and uh, um, she says, uh, uh, Bruce, when you come to pick up Evelyn, can you come into my office? Now, Miss Candace is one of those people that um, is primped all the way. I mean, she's just like, looks like a stereotypical principal that you're scared of. And I went to the principal's office a lot growing up. And so, um, but Evelyn apparently had this interaction. Um, they were um, playing family in the playground. And my children, if you were to meet Robin, Robin's the same height as me. Our children are not big people. They're just not going to be. My mother is five foot. Evelyn is probably stalled at like 4'11". And so when they play family, who is she? Baby, right? So she's playing baby with this uh, girl uh, named Zoe. I don't even change her name anymore to protect her. Um, Zoe. Zoe is in the playground and decides that that day she's going to be all over Evelyn. And so it says to Evelyn, you're the baby. You're a baby. You're so little. You're a baby. Baby, baby, baby. Just da -da -da -da. So Evelyn picks up a stick and smacks her over the head. So I'm in Miss Candace's office getting this story, and my inside voice is saying, well, she kind of deserved it, right? <laughs> Don't you think a little bit, Miss Candace? No, I didn't say it because Miss Candace would have. I don't know what she did. So I take Evelyn outside afterwards. I'm saying, so Ev, how did today go? And she's like, oh, it was okay. I'm like, so really, nothing happened? Well, I had to sit on the bench. Hmm. Anything else? Uh, 
<laughs> Zoe got hit with a stick. <laughs> this is when you should just get worried about your kids that they can kind of like figure out how not to lie but not tell you everything. That was connected, honey, right? So we sh I begin to hear the story a little bit. And so she, you know, talks about getting angry. And I'm, and I'm doing the whole, you think you could have handled your anger differently? You know, maybe you should have walked away and got a grown-up and all these kinds of things. And finally, I said, so Evelyn, why do you think you did it? And she says to me, Dad, that's just the way God made me. <laughs> Normally, a pastor's heart would be like, oh. But I'm like, What? Like, what we had discovered over that time in raising our kids was that we had been telling them, her, for so much that she was special and wonderful, which she is and was at that point, too. I mean, that this created being and all these wonderful things, and we're now moving to the stage where, oh, yeah, we also have to talk about the stuff that doesn't go so well. So how do you talk about things you do that turn yourself away from the way God may want you to be? She's always taught me that for my own self and for the church, I think the church learns a lot from that particular story for me, that we've done amazing things as churches, but that doesn't mean we don't have the capacity to kind of shift and turn away from God, personally and as an institution. So um, one of my favorite pictures ever, there is an actual group on Flickr called Donkey Sanctuary, where it's just a bunch of asses in front of stained windows. <laughs> so... <laughs> I graduated from seminary when I was 25 years old, and uh, um, not that age, you know, I, there's something about experience, now that, I'm, now that I'm 45, how old am I? 45, yes. Um, you know, I, I do think there's something about experience and age, but, you know, I came out of seminary, and I was one of those kids that, um, in the Presbyterian Church USA, you know, we're, we're pretty white. We're like 94%, depending on who you talk to. And so when there are young brown people that are breathing, they send you to seminary. And so... Um, we, you know, I went to seminary and I was told, you should go to seminary, you should go to seminary, you should go to seminary. And I didn't really think about it seriously. I was going to go to law school. That was my initial uh, plan. So my mother said, you should think about going to seminary. And again, I've, one time in my life I have stood up against my mother. Um, and I didn't at that point. So I went to seminary. So I went to the seminary pretty cocky. I, I was one of those that kind of went in. I'm like, I can talk in front of people. You know, just let me have a church. I'll humor you professors. Yeah, but just let me get out and get going. So I go into my first church, um, which is a multi-generational kind of, it's a classic thing where an urban church didn't do anything wrong. There was no scandal. They were four to 500 people in the 50s and 60s. And by the time I got there, it was like 40 people in worship. Most of the neighborhood had changed. I mean, it's a classic example. So I got there, though, and there are still gatekeepers, right? That's why those churches stay alive, is there are pillars of those churches that keep those churches going. And I, I've grown fond of them. Pillars are wonderful, but they are also pillars that can't move, and so it's a, a great tension. Lucille Tobiasen was a pillar for me there. Lucille was the elder who, um, when I got there, she told me, she said, Bruce, so you know, I've been an elder longer than you've been alive. Welcome. Right? So Lucille is also the one who would take me to the back of the sanctuary and walk through all of the pictures of the pastor's. Uh, and tell little stories just to let her know that she knew a little bit more about them than other people would know and kind of cement her place in the lore. And then she got all the way to the end, and it was Betsy Massey right before me, and each of them had a little plaque with how long they'd been there. And so she said, and then your picture will go there. And I said, oh, well, how long am I going to be here, Lucille? Can I just know now? She didn't think it was very funny. I was like, oh, okay, that's not cute. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on. So I'm a young pastor. You know, I kind of think... I know what should happen at this church, worship should change, all these things, which I don't think I was wrong. I just didn't know how to handle that well. But Lucille was one of those that would, did not hold her tongue. She was not one that was going to, like, you know, at all hold back. And so Lucille was a very proper Presbyterian, a very proper urban Presbyterian. She hardly ever went out without a hat on and was always dressed up really well. And so she came to my office one day on a Monday, and um, I always um, came back in on Monday to decompress from Sunday, figure out what was going on. And um, she comes into the church office, knocks on the door, and Inga opens the door. And Inga was my assistant at that time. And those of you that have assistants, you know their primary job is to protect you, right? So a pastor's primary, an assistant, is to protect the pastor. So she says, of course, yes, he's in his office. <laughs> because she's scared of Lucille and not me. 
So Lucille comes clomping down this long hallway, and I can hear her clomping down. And I kid you not, I closed my door. Maybe she'll forget where the office is. So she knocks on the door, and she says, Bruce, are you in there? No pastor, nothing formal. It was Bruce. And I paused and wanted to say, no. So I opened the door, but I get behind my desk. Right? Those of you that understand office dynamics, you put a big piece of furniture in between people so that they know whose space this is. Don't come in here all up in my face talking, telling me how to run the church. So I'm the pastor. My desk. Right here. She doesn't care, right? So she walks in and she says, Bruce, do you know what happened on Sunday? I'm like, <clears throat> now, it is not unknown for me to have done things on Sundays that deserved rebuke. The second Sunday I was there, I stuck my coffee cup on the piano. Yeah, yeah, you're all, you're like, yeah. Oh, should have been fired. Right, and so, so I, and I, I, what, you know, as I got to know them a little bit, I'd come in, and I'd do this with the, like, my cup towards the piano, and you could see the choir go, <gasps> and then I'd do this, and they go, oh, and i go, oh, and I'm like, so certainly I deserve her some book. I, I, we had to come to an agreement about what were swear words and what weren't swear words. Because I would just talk and say stuff that apparently some people in the congregation thought were swear words. Who could have known? Anyway. So there were certainly things. But she comes in, and I had no idea. Bruce, do you know what happened on Sunday? No. Do you know what happened on Sunday? No. Do you know what happened on Sunday? As if changing the emphasis on a word would jog my memory. No, Lucille, I have no idea what happened on Sunday. Bruce, the flowers were in the wrong place. Keep in mind my pastoral sensitivity and how wise I was at that stage in my ministry. So the first thing that I said was, I don't care. Yeah, exactly. It's like putting toothpaste back in the tube. You try to get those words back a little bit. It gets worse and messier and everything. It's just crazy. And like if she was a cartoon, her face would have turned red and steam would have come out of her ears and her hat would have rose from her head. And so we go at it. We're like... Rah, 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 rah. And, and it, was, it ended up being a great cathartic moment, I think, for us in our relationship. Lucille Tobiasen had been at this church for probably 40 or 50 years. She had, in many ways, grown up in that church when she was a single woman in San Francisco, working, went to college and worked, and all that. And she would, every Sunday after church, she would go get those flowers that were in the middle of the sanctuary, right in front of the, uh, right before um, our thing here, <laughs> altar. We, we, Presbyterians don't call it that, though. <laughs> the table, community table. This is how long I've been out of a congregation. The thingy here. They're not inviting me ever back again. Okay, so, so she takes that and then she delivers it to the retirement home uh, uh, that we partnered with. And then she would go look at the list of the sign-ups on the back wall of who's bringing flowers the next time. And then she would call those people up and for the 30 years she'd give them the same exact directions. Here's who you call, here's where it's delivered, da da da. Then Sunday morning she would get there like at 8 o'clock, far before any of the staff. She would go get those flowers out of the office. She'd bring them in, put them right in the middle on a well-worn ring in the carpet. Then she would walk all the way to the back and do this to make sure it was centered. I came to love just watching her look if they're centered. And then she would go back in, adjust a little bit, and then she would sit fourth row on the right with her husband, Marty. And for decades... They watch children get baptized. They watch memorials and weddings and sermons and pastors all through the lens of that experience in those flowers. And her pastor just told her he didn't care. It was telling for me at that moment about the importance of us not thinking the church is about us. Because it wasn't, you know, you step away from that and really the flowers don't matter, right? Big picture, they don't matter. But there's always something like that that somebody cares about, and we as the church tell them, we don't really care. And every context is going to be different. I often flip that around and talk about young adults or a new generation that we are telling when they're, just like Lucille, yearn for that kind of holy experience, and that was the lens through which she, she met God. There are people in our world who are yearning for that same experience, but we tell them, no, the way you have to do that is actually through the flowers. 
and not in other ways. But there are always going to be some kind of flowers for each of us, and I think that's part of uh, my learning as a pastor over time, is that it doesn't revolve around me. This is the church that I pastored, um, uh, helped us start in San Francisco. Um, this was um, it was called Mission Bay Community Church. It's a church that we, um, were fa- we founded it on the idea that there would be more 20s and 30s, more 30s and 40s. People held that against us a lot. They said, so if I'm 50, I can't come. <laughs> well, I always, always say, you can't, because <laughs> you're kind of a jerk. Um, I actually don't say those things. That's just big invoice, inside voice talking big. I don't really. Um, I would say something like, we don't check ID. You just need to look young. No, I don't say that either. Um, but we were committed to this, right? Presbyterians, like I'm sure many other churches, we had a lot of intergenerational churches. We had very few that were young, adult kind of things. So, um, but I'm, I'm one of those that believes in denominations. I am one of those that we are post-denominational in many ways. We were like post-50s and 60s denominational, but we, we're now kind of figuring out what does this look like next. I think there's something powerful about committing to discerning together. Um, for us Presbyterians, we do that in committee structure, right? Those are We call them corporate bishops in our world where we get together. And so that just slows things down even more. There's always times like, oh, we have a bishop. I know that we don't have the image of bishops that is probably reality, but our image of bishops is, oh, bishops just get to decree stuff and everybody does it, right? I know that doesn't happen really, but that's what we want bishops to do. But there are times where we're like, oh, this is why we do this, right? In our tradition, um, we value, you know, every voice that speaks can, can skew and change things because the spirit moves through everybody gathered in the room and no one person holds any more power. At least structurally, that's what we're supposed to do. And I think it's something about, um, again, I'm a big tech person. I love all of the technology. But there's something about the church saying to the world, sometimes we choose to be in a situation that takes longer. And that we choose the frustrating nature of that because we believe God speaks through that in important ways, rather than to choose speed and efficiency. Now, that is not always, that is not an excuse not to take on new things, but it does say that if you're going to be part of a denomination like I am or part of a body of people, it would be easier not to, right? I mean, it would just be easier, but yet we are choosing to do this. And so the, the church that we started was very, very, we were like, we are part of the Presbyterian Church USA. So we had young adults who knew they were Christian, who were progressive, and were Presbyterian, which we call them the whole unicorns in the Presbyterian Church, right? Because they don't exist, but they do. And I think any version of the church, any manifestation of the church can create those moments and those places um, for the next generation of people. What time are we doing? Am I like... Okay. Oh, no. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I love technology. Um, and these aren't... I don't have... I have a few more stories, but these are just kind of... I want to make sure... I, I love the fact that this event happens. I think this is a wonderful moment to begin to step both in the to-dos, but also kind of keep in the, the why are we doing it and what does this mean long-term. And I, I want to say that I sense a, a huge openness to the possibilities that technology and digital media and all the, those things bring. Um, and so I just want to leave you a few things that I, when I do these kind of workshop thingies, um, that are important to me. Um, the first is this, you'll not and you should not keep up with everything. There are some of you I know that love all the new stuff, and so like you've never seen the social network you haven't joined, right? That's, and that's great, but ultimately we're not, and the church is not in the business of technology and social media. It is simply a tool. And we need to give ourselves permission to not be up on everything. I love today. Who was, who was the woman that tweeted for the first time? There you go, right? You may, you may hate it, though, right? You may decide next week, I don't want to do this. And I think that is perfectly fine. But you gave it a shot, right? I mean, I think that was um, lovely. I, there was, the best part was, I have an announcement. I just tweeted. It was awesome. It was beautiful. All right. <laughs> so this, what is that? Anybody guess? Any guesses? No? It's a Walkman. Some of you remember those. You know those are coming back now, right? They have fake-looking Walkmans that you put a disc in. It is the silliest thing ever. It's like those phone handsets that look like old phones, but they plug into your mobile. Silly kids these days. You will not break the internet. 
So you can try anything you want. I mean, some of you may be smart enough to break it, but I, not that I don't think you're smart, but you will not break the internet. I know that so many folks, when they start looking and playing with all this stuff, they're like, I might break something. I'm like, you're not going to break the internet. It'll be okay. And God's going to keep asking you to do some crazy things. Abraham and Sarah were asked to have a child, right? Told, right? Um, Robin and I always joke, my youngest child, Ab Annie, she wants us to have another baby. That is not happening. <laughs> and Robin, and, Robin, I always joke, I'm like, well, Sarah had one. You're like, I get Abraham, being the male in the relationship, Sarah had one. <laughs> She's like, well, then you have it. Right? So, you know, Sarah laughed, nervous laughter, you know, it wasn't like, woo! Um, and Abraham, you know, gave the best of what they had. I think that part of our denominational world, it, as well as kind of technology, is that until you take that last breath, God's not done. And it's, if you get to get up in the morning, then God's probably going to ask of you something beyond your imagination. And I think our job is to listen for that. Technology is just one of those things, but we have to listen for how God is asking us. This is a, a person, 92, so she must be 95 now and ran the Honolulu Marathon. That seems crazy to me, by the way. I hope God never asks that of me. I laughed for like five minutes when I found this picture. <laughs> so I'm a, a total hobby photographer. I'm like, how long did he wait to get that? <laughs> or was he just like, sh, 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 sh. got it? Got the poop? It will only work if you embrace it with the same care as you do with everything else in ministry. <laughs> it's like, why does the poop picture there? Because <laughs> you either poop on people with all this cred, yeah, it's a hard connection. Anyway, um, part of somebody was just asked on. I was just doing a conversation with somebody about, can you use social media for, for pastoral care? And like, yeah, and kind of talking about how do you care, like the same way you would discipline yourself around visitations and communion and all preaching and all that. How do you say, take the same care with this really precious communication tool that we have? And how do you do that? And I think that if you don't do that, then what you tend to do is it it feels forced, and it feels like you're just doing it because everybody else is, or you don't really want to do it. And so finding that sweet spot of being able to really embrace it in your ministry is really important. All right, let's talk about race. And I'm almost just done. So um, this is me. Uh, second grade. My mother um, must have had a heart attack when I brought this home. So... Um, most of you have been hearing this word microaggressions now. Uh, that has been very popular in the last few years. It really became popular after my book came out. Um, so microaggressions basically are these subtle things we keep saying to each other that reinforce stuff. It's not the kind of the nasty name calling and up to it's it's the it's the subtle things. You know, things like I'm raising three girls, right? We never say in our house anything like a girl. Right? Unless they just did something really awesome and they're like, Yeah, I play like a girl. Like they'll do that. But, you know, we'll never, you know, that, those phrases around um, diminishing based on feminine, you know, um, images, you know, those are microaggressions. And so our, you know, we've, I've been, our family is really intentional about that. Same go for race, that there are microaggressions that happen. This is me, right? This is a self-portrait that I did. Um, and this is in Sacramento, California. This is during, so it had been in the 70s when, a good number of folk, uh, folks were immigrating from um, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and the, in Sacramento, the narrative was around that those boat people were coming and eating our dogs. They were going in the parks, they were getting stray dogs, they were getting squirrels, they were, this is what was the narrative about the Asian community there, specifically with um, uh, those who were coming from uh, Vietnam. And so, this is the image that I carried during that time. This is, I have this picture framed um, at my home and hung in my office wherever I've gone to remind me about how microaggressions affect everyone. I mean, we all get them. And, and in the same ways that we receive them, we have to do the micro, you know, kind of also affirmations and figure out what those begin to look like. And I think today, most of our issues around race have to do with a lot of microaggressions that go on. I'm just going to give you one example. Um, so, um, I get this a lot, but I don't see you as Asian. And, um, you know, again, my inside voice is much more bold than my outside voice, but, you know, I'm like, well, if you don't see me as Asian, why did you just say that to me? 
right? I mean, the only reason you would need to say that to me is because you did. And that's okay, right? We are fighting a generational shift between never treat anybody different because of the color of their skin, right? At that grand narrative to you need to understand the nuance of culture, right? That's a hard shift, right? So I don't, I don't, I try not to make anybody feel guilty about the struggle between this, but aren't we post-racial? Aren't I supposed to be colorblind to the, I can't figure out all the nuances of what it means to be Asian, I'm sorry. And where does that all fit in? And so this is one of those that I get in many very different ways around these kind of these awkward moments and these sentences and phrases that we say, and there, there's a bunch of them um, like this. And so, you know, I, I kind of tell folks, but part of that means that you have, you have in some ways said to me that a huge part of who I am doesn't matter. It'd be like me going up to a woman and saying, hi, you know, I don't see you as a woman. Not only is that a little creepy, but it's like, then what do you see me as? Right? I mean, that, that, that's the, f I just see you as a person. Like a mannequin? Like, I'm not sure, right? It's just, you know, if you, it, it's an, it's, it feels like the thing we say because we've been taught this, right? We're no longer, we're in a church place now, Jew or Greek, right? No longer male or female, slave like or free, right? And we use that passage over and over again as a, we should all understand that we're one in the body of Christ, which is not a bad intent. But if you know that passage, right, we have, we have, and I don't use this word much, we have perverted that passage and softened it. That was a passage about economic injustice, slave and free, about gender justice, male or female, and about culture, right? It wasn't, we should all just be multicultural. It was challenging the church to change the ways in which it treated people. And we want to go to that next one. And so we, we, we feed that narrative into this one that we like that says we're all just people. Because I really think being the body of Christ is acknowledging the difference. Not just in a toleration mode and all that, but that we actually acknowledge and somehow that feeds into this beautiful complexity that God has created. And that's a hard, hard thing for us to do, but yet one that I think we need to. So... Um, I encourage people to have conversations about race that are awkward because the only way that you get through the awkwardness of all of this is to have more. Um, I speak at a lot of like preschools and I do some work with parents in San Francisco. Most of them are fairly white um, and always uh, a white couple, mom, dad, stands up and says, we just don't know how to talk about race. It feels so awkward. And, I'll, and I will say, I said, well, brown people talk about race all the time. Right? It's not awkward to us. This is like we talk about all the time. The only way that you get over this is to actually have the conversations over and over again. Um, so a little bit about race. All right, last one. So this is my grandmother and my grandfather. Do you remember his name? Esteban de los Reyes. Or Steve Reyes, as the US government calls him. And that's my mother there. So. Um, my um, grandmother, who I told you was crazy, right? This is my grandma, who um, she was w kind of a wild child. I think that that was just kind of in her personality. Um, but she was always very committed to family and church. Um, she cared for, she took care of me when my mom was a single mom. She, my grandmother had these long nails that were like two inches long. And whenever I misbehaved in church, like I only had to be pitched one time. Right, and then every other time it's just right. So this is my but my grandmother and my grandfather divorced um, um, probably when they were in their fifties or so. And um, my grandmother, uh, one of the traits that our family has that we're trying not to pass on to my children is we hold grudges. Like it's really hard to get on our grudge list. We call it something else, obviously, our list. But once you're on, it's really hard to get off. Like it's re I, there are times Robin's like, are you still mad at that person? Yes. Wasn't that in elementary school? So. So this is my grandmother, right? So she and my grandfather had a kind of not a good split. Um, and my grandmother, um, those, my grandmother got the church, and my grandfather had to go to another church. And it was kind of a lot of drama in our family at that point in life. Um, 
and my grandmother remarried, my grandfather remarried, all that. But um, my grandmother um, was a deacon in the church, and she always um, would, she hated going to the hospital, which is hard as a deacon not to ever go to the hospital. She had this idea that if she went to the hospital, she was so afraid that she was the person, the person who was sick was waiting for so they could die. She would always say, I'm not going because they're just waiting for me. And I'm like, oh, well, they're just waiting for you, Grandma. Aren't you special? Maybe they're not. So Grandma had this thing going. And so my grandmother in the mid-'80s, um, uh, she had a heart attack and was in the hospital and uh, was on life support and the whole kind of thing. If any of you have had to walk through that kind of death, it's both beautiful and painful and all those things. And my mother and I, right, um, were, oh, so this would have been in the 90s, actually, because we were both ordained already. And um, um, so we're giving way to the family pastor now. We've sat and talked with him and said, we are not the pastors of this family. Do not worry. This is, this is your, your, your thing. You need to pastor us through this. I thought it was, I thought it was extremely humble of us. <sighs> because my pastor at the home was horrible. Um, it took my mom and I all we could do to call him pastor. Um, he, one time, he walked into church one time. I'm not going to tell who it is, because um, you all going to know. Um, though he went to Princeton. Any Princeton grads here? No? Oh, bummer. I could razz you about it. So um, he went to Princeton, and he one time walked into church on Sunday and told from the pulpit, said, um, last night my printer broke, um, so I, don't, I couldn't print my sermon out. And everybody's like, oh, okay. He's just going to wing it. That's fine, whatever. But I taped my practice one. You could finish the story, right? Pulls out the tape recorder, bends the mic down, hits play, and sits in the front pew. You can't make that up. So we let him in, and he's kind of what tending to us, but he couldn't stay long because it was the night of Diana's uh, Princess Di's funeral, and so we had to go watch that down in the, in the emergency room. Yeah, he's a winner. Um, so... I have had it out with him, so that my outside voice has actually spoken to him about this. Um, but my grandmother is sitting there, and my, <laughs> he walks in and looks at this woman who's bloated and tubes and says, this is the face of Christ. My relatives who are not church are like, what? Christ is an old, bloated Filipina? <laughs> Apparently. So we're with Grandma at this stage of life, right? You know, Grandma, as we knew her, was no longer there. We had decided as the family, um, you know, that we were going to take her off of life support and all this. And this is the same grandmother, right, that made her way from Little Rock, Arkansas to Stockton, California, had a thriving life, all of that. So we're all standing around the bed. And if any of you have ever had to do this, right, you stand around the bed. And in the movies, when the machines get turned off, they die, right? That's what happens. So, yeah, those of you that have seen it, right? So we're, everybody saw him, turns off the machines. Grandma keeps breathing. And we just bust out laughing, right? Those of you, those of you that are in that, you know, you know that moment where you're just like so tired and so sad that all you can do is laugh. Because it was like figures, Grandma. Just one more like bird to us, right? It was just kind of like, I'm not dying yet. So the family starts to take turns sitting with Grandma towards the end of like we're <laughs> like how long are we gonna wait, Grandma? Come on! I mean, you know, you're a for leadership, right? You, anyway, so we're we're taking these turns, and uh, my mother is with her um, on the night that she ended up dying, and says she realized this thing I told you about my mom, my, my grandmother not wanting to go to the hospital, and so she leans over and she says, "Daddy's not coming." because she was waiting for my grandfather. And then she died, like half an hour later. It's one of those kind of like, my, grand, my mom just is like, she really was just waiting. It was this amazing kind of thing that, that it, what it, we share that story in our family as one of those jokes of like, how stubborn are you going to be, right? Grandma was so stubborn that she waited until her death before, in some ways, acknowledge this kind of commitment and this love and this connection and that there's something lovely and really kind of telling for us as people and as the church to um, uh, 
uh, how we're going to interact together. All right. So last one. Favorite book ever. Have any of you not read this book? Because I'm going to spoil it. It's very... So at the end of this, this book is a great book. Every time he says, don't turn the page, there's a monster at the end of the book, and he builds a brick wall, and you turn the page. He's like, oh, you're so strong. And then he builds a chain. No, you're so strong. Don't, don't turn it again. There's a monster at the end of the book. And he finally gets to the end, and it's just Grover. And he says, oh, it's just me, furry, lovable little Grover. One of the things about church and communities and our world for me today is that we put so much pressure on everything that we do that when we talk about race or we talk about family, we, talk, we want every event to end up with some result. We want everything to end up with some kind of thing we can take home and say, look what happened. When ultimately, the, the, the brilliance of God's creation and I think some of the beauty of it is really it's just us hanging out. And the church at its strongest, communities at its strongest, is when we're just kind of in that time together. Right? In between all the amazing celebrations that we post on everything or all those little things, what we had for dinner, where we went, what are we tired about, what are we sad about, all, all that, that's what makes us the church, that's what makes us community. So I always think about that on this particular book. Um, with so, all right. Do we have time for Q&A? Okay. So um, this was today, so I hate turning in slides early, because I always like, oh, I got an idea. So this was like at 12.30 today. I'm like, ooh, a Jeopardy board would be an awesome way to do Q&A. So I found one and then put them up. So um, we have some time for some questions. We can talk about anything. I really do talk about and have opinion about um, any and everything. So you can talk about social media, race, family, church, denominations, the Oakland A's. Not. Not. Yes, you have, you, well, you have to do that, because that's... So, I don't know if this is uh, unique to the Episcopal... Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, there is a wild card on that. I end. guess the, yeah, it'll be an 800 wild card or something. Um, so, I don't know if... you know I don't know enough about Presbyterian Church to know this, but um, there seems to be um, a real attachment... Uh, in the church to having the church have an opinion on every single social issue that comes out. Um, I'm at an alternative to our general... Uh, alternative. <laughs> um, I'm an alternate deputy to our general convention next year. That's even better. That's yes. um, the alternative? I'm al on the alternative. Um, and we're talking about restructuring the Episcopal Church, which, of course, you know, in 10 minutes or less. Um, but there seems to be this challenge with people going, well, you know, we don't want to lose our prophetic voice. Um, and I'm like, who is paying any attention to yeah. what the Episcopal Church says? Now, some people are, but I seriously... So I would like to yeah. sort of hear you about I have a, what I have is that... And what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, so I was the moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA, which I do not take lightly at all. I think there were many people who were disappointed that we elected somebody so young. And I know the, the headlines when I got elected was, he blogs, um, he's young, and he doesn't wear a tie. Like, that was, that was like the narrative for me when I was moderator. I was 39. I had three kids. It wasn't a former moderator, an older former moderator said in the hallway afterwards, well, if we're electing children as moderators now, this denomination's over. I'm like, please be my pastor, right? I'm like, so, um, so I, but I also, that office um, ultimately ha didn't have as much power as people wanted it to have, right? It didn't, so within our family, though, it was a powerful place to be and to speak into spoken pulpits that had never had a young Asian American with an earring and a tattoo in it and probably will never will again. Those kinds of things. So there is, I, I think the church still has more social capital than oftentimes we want to give ourselves credit for. We don't know how to, 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 to manage that and to shift it into movement that is beyond our own survival. Because it eventually turns into, how can the Presbyterian church do this? As opposed to, we find this bond, how can we come alongside of these movements? That, that's one thing that I think we, in some ways, we do have some social capital. I think what you're saying, we do the same thing, right? We come out with a statement, this coming up General Assembly in, in Detroit, our big issue will be divestment. Right? That's going to be, 
when I was moderator, by far the, more, the most emails I got were about divestment in the Middle East, far above combined ordination, marriage, any of that. Um, and some would say, who cares what the Presbyterian Church says? And I think within our own context in the US, I think there is some truth to that. Um, but I, what I discovered when I was traveling around the world, that there are people that listen to their denominational parents, you know, not in a, not in a, a patronizing way, but when I would travel as the moderator of the Presbyterian Church to Taiwan, they actually cared and had influence there. And so as a progressive place there, they could lean on some of the statements that we made. And so I think there is, it's going to be different. You know, I don't know how you all work globally as much. Um, at the same time, I do agree. I think sometimes we put so much energy into some things that we lose out and we use it as a way to just fall back into patterns of fighting that we know how to do. And I think that's, that's a very um, boomer, older ex model, right? We know how to strategize and fight. And you know, I can kick butt with Robert's rules when I need to have them and, and use that. But that's not how the rest of the next generation is integrating and making decisions. So I think it's safe for us to fight in many ways. It preserves our safe space for many of us who've been part of the church for so long. So I think we have to challenge that. But I still do think we, we do need to make statements that are prophetic. I think that is important for us to go through that process together to, to wrestle with that as denominations. Um, and then free each other up to go do a lot of different things. Because if, if we don't take advantage of size of denomination and the number of people that can go do different things, then we're, we're, we're losing something about why we're even gathered together. Okay. I'm not uh, choosing anyone. Okay, we have two more questions, and we're going to call it a night because I know people are exhausted. Okay, I'll take let's talk about race for 200. <laughs> um, my church is in an affluent mostly white community, and I don't know if that is true of anyone else in this room. Uh, <laughs> but Pastor says yes. Yes. Um, but one of the things I struggle with is the combo package of our interactions with race also being interactions with poverty and how to avoid like superhero syndrome. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could touch on that. <laughs> Don't do that. No, I, I think it's really hard because, again, we fall into this. Some, I was just meeting with a house church in Oakland, and they took vows to each other as a community of about 12 people, and one of them was peacemaking. And so their, one of their ideas was one of them works in a school where there's uh, mostly African American, and then he's also really good friends with the police chief. He says, I just want to get them together because that seems to be an issue in Oakland, which is very true. And, and I think was, well, as long as you don't expect one meeting is going to be like, ooh, now we're good, right? And so part of any conversations about race that get beyond, you know, X, poor, X, race, da, 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 have to be long-term commitments to relationship building and not really about we're working with poor brown people if that happens to be the case, right? It has to be we're, we're eating in this area, we're hanging out together, we're doing things, and then the stories about what it means to be whoever is in that circle, become they, they come out of that as opposed to here's where we want you to start. And we have one meeting where we need to solve this and do this. I'm, and I think that's hard for us because we want, we want ends. We want a, uh, not just a strategy, but we want the, uh, the tactics. And we want to be able to know at the end of this three-month program, how are we going to measure it? Right, that, going back to that thing. And I think you say, well, we measure it that we met every two weeks. And, and I, I think that's great. Right? And so how do you, I think you have to build in serious commitment to having conversations that actually are not about the core issues that you may think you'd be want to address. Okay. All right. I think she says it was the same thing. So Bruce Reyes Chow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce has, there's his contact information. Um, he has some books next door. He'll be here to talk to you right now. If you want him to sign a book, he certainly could do that. Um, but he does have opinions about all of these matters, and they are informed opinions. They're not, they're, no, I, that's part of what makes, 
So, so do spend some time with him if you get a chance. But have a lovely evening. Blessings to you all. We gather at 9 tomorrow morning.